let me start with just some observations. The first uh, and a very important one is uh, the speed at which events change and what's in front of people's radar screen should give us pause. If you go back to January, our conventional wisdom was that uh, this would be an election about the impeachment effort. Um, that's not on anybody's radar screen right now. And then for at least a couple of months, it was all COVID all the time. And when they stopped doing their daily briefings, um, where the president would go on and on in rants, um, we moved a little bit away from that. And obviously with the events in Minneapolis, um, it's completely pivoted as we're talking about the role of police in society, the role of race, the uh, history from the beginnings and roots of our republic of racism. And that may be an enduring subject. It will certainly be in a lot of ways, but we have to keep in mind that over the next four and a half months, other things may intervene domestically or internationally, and we may be in a different place when it comes to the issues that are motivating people. Having said that, um, Donald Trump is in a very bad place right now, and the country, of course, is in a very bad place right now. I am skeptical of polls in general these days. Um, most polls are shoddy. They are telephone surveys done that uh, in many cases do not have adequate samples of cell phones, which are the fundamental ways in which most people communicate now because it's costly to get cell phone numbers. And they're often done over a shorter period of time. And we know that the response rates for surveys is 9% and dropping. Um, you are probably like me, calls that are spam calls come in by the dozens. Um, I know now when I get a call where it says unavailable or uh, a number I don't recognize that I just uh, answer and hang up uh, if there's not an immediate uh, response from somebody. I get calls for surveys four or five or six times a week and most people just don't want to do it. So they end up trying to um, match different categories and you cannot take any individual poll seriously. The accumulated impact is a different matter. And on that basis, the most significant thing right now is that we have a series of surveys suggesting that the disapproval of Trump is at 58% on average. And that's a disastrous place for a president to be. Um, maybe more striking is that 40% uh, of Americans still approve of his conduct in office, given what's happened. And here I would mention a word that I've used since the beginning of this presidency, and that is cacistocracy, which is a 17th century word that fell into disuse that um, with the help of several people, me included, has come back. I wrote a piece in the Atlantic a couple of years ago called American Cacistocracy. It has a Greek root and it means government of the worst sort by the worst and most unscrupulous among us. And that is what we have right now. And we've seen it in particular with uh, the response to the COVID epidemic. One of the things that's very striking is I've spent a fair amount of time in Australia and was a part for a number of years in what's called the Australian American Leadership Dialogue, where every other year, I and about 40 to 50 Americans would travel to Australia and meet with their elites uh, in government, in business, in journalism, and elsewhere. And then they would come here. So I've gotten to know Australian politics and politicians fairly well. Their conservative party, which is called the Liberal Party, has gone off in a more right-wing direction, as has happened with most uh, conservative parties around the world. And their prime minister at the moment, Scott Morrison, is not a terribly distinguished figure. But when COVID hit, he listened to the experts and the epidemiologists, um, put in social distancing immediately, made sure that they were ramped up with the right personal protective equipment uh, and the hospitals were set for it. And they ended up with very, very few deaths and a smaller number of cases. And his approval, which was down in the 40s, is now in the 70s or 80s. 
And if Donald Trump had reacted that way, we would be in a very different place politically right now. But through weeks of denial, of suggesting that it was no big deal, of refusing to ramp up, of not doing the right things when it came to protective equipment, of not insisting on social distancing, and indeed unleashing tribal forces around the country. Tweets that said, free Michigan, which meant that we had, of course, a mob with AR-15 storm the Capitol there, among other things, all have contributed to what is now a growing number of cases, while what we see in the European Union and elsewhere is the beginnings of significant decline. Uh, in some ways, the closest to what we have uh, in the United States right now is Sweden, which not for malign reasons, but for misguided uh, uh, ev advice from their epidemiologists, decided to have only voluntary social distancing, keep the schools open, and hope that they could reach herd immunity very quickly, which means about 65% or more of the population develop antibodies, and that protects the population in general. It's been a catastrophe. Not only did it not help their economy, but of course, compared to comparable countries, other Nordic countries and others in Europe that were hit with the virus around the same time and operated in the same way, they've had uh, per capita sizably more deaths. And we are on a path to having a substantial increase in deaths. It's already happening in many states that have opened up prematurely. One of the interesting political, political ramifications of this is that while it's happening, <coughs> excuse me, in California on the West Coast, where it's really starting to hit now is in places like Texas, Florida, Arkansas, uh, and the Carolinas and uh, other Southern states, red states. And now it's starting to move significantly into rural areas where they are extraordinarily ill-equipped to deal with this increase. They don't have the hospital space. They don't have people who know how to deal with the ventilators. And what we're seeing partly as a consequence of that is that Trump's support among some of his mainstay groups, and in particular older voters, who are of course, as we know only too well, vulnerable, uh, particularly to the virus, are uh, getting not terribly happy. If we look at the response uh, to uh, the uh, dramatic changes in our attitudes towards policing and Black Lives Matter, Trump's reaction to that has also caused him some headaches and problems with a group that was already becoming uneasy about him. People who'd voted for him in 2016, suburban college educated voters who began to move in a different direction with the midterms, which is why of course, Democrats were able to recapture their majority in the House of Representatives. And if that continues, that means that many more states that uh, went to Trump in 2016. States like Georgia, uh, Arizona, and uh, Florida, possibly even uh, places like Texas and North Carolina will be in play. If the election were held today, and a big if, if it were a free and fair one, um, there's no doubt in my mind that Republicans would suffer a landslide defeat. They would lose the Senate. Um, probably have a uh, smaller share of the House of Representatives and lose the White House handily. But I'll repeat, the election is not held today. Um, things can change. The world can change. And uh, it's still possible for Donald Trump to lose the popular vote, uh, which he did last time by 3 million, by 5 or 6 million, and still eke out a narrow um, uh, electoral vote majority. And we have to keep in mind that there are multiple efforts in multiple states to make sure it's not a free and fair election. Voter suppression is underway in many places. We saw what happened with the primary in Wisconsin, where the Republican legislature uh, refused to uh, allow expanded uh, voting by mail, where they took uh, what would normally be 70 polling places in Milwaukee and reduced them to five and dared people in the midst of the pandemic to turn out, which meant long lines. The public did turn out and it didn't um, 
play out the way that the Republicans in the Wisconsin legislature and on the Supreme Court hoped because the critical election in that primary was for a Supreme Court seat. But we know that they will double down again in the fall. And we've seen this in Georgia where the governor manipulated the votes in 2018 to uh, when he was secretary of state to win a highly disputed election against Stacey Abrams, saw his protege put in as secretary of state. And here again, they're trying to curtail absentee balloting at a time of COVID and uh, cut down the polling places, didn't produce the absentee ballots. And uh, we've seen, uh, uh, again, uh, very bad results. That's happening in a lot of places. And we also know that Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump, among others, are trying to keep the Postal Service from getting the money that they need to operate in a full-fledged way, which in turn will make it more difficult to do absentee balloting. And if and when we get another tranche of support for uh, state and local governments and uh, for uh, public that's continuing to struggle, um, it's gonna be up to House Democrats to insist on funding for the states and their localities to be able to print up those ballots. And in states that are not used to having 50 or 60 or 70% votes by mail, the appropriate infrastructure to make it work. We're gonna have other issues with the election. We know that one of the things that happened in Georgia and Fulton County is that the two main election administrators came down with COVID. And so the people who are uh, tasked with running the election were absent. And at the same time, they have saw a drastic decline in poll workers. As you probably know, poll workers on average are in their 60s. Um, every time any of us have gone to the polls, we see this. Um, they're a vulnerable population. People who either have come down with COVID or are fearful of getting it in a setting where lots of people are gathered together. And one of the things that I'm hoping to do, I'm participating in a number of task forces on election uh, crises is to get uh, high schools, colleges, and universities, I'm hoping the University of Minnesota will participate in this, to encourage their students to be poll workers, get trained early on, participate in the process, uh, because we're going to need as many as we possibly can, and to help. And of course, one of the great things at the University of Minnesota is the Humphrey School has one of the best uh, election administration uh, programs in the country, it's a uh, world-class leader in this field to step up the game and help to make sure that we can have absentee ballots available for people, sent out in application forms to all voters in as many states as we can, and make sure they're counted on time. I would give you a warning. It is, unless we have an absolute landslide, very unlikely that we will know the election results for the presidential contest or for many Senate contests on election eve or the next day. Um, counting the absentee ballots can take a very long time, and especially if you don't have enough people to do it, and you have to do things like signature matches uh, and in some cases uh, other verification. Many states that are trying to make it harder for people to do this, um, and getting those counted could take a week or 10 days. And uh, people are not used to that. And of course, there'll be all kinds of charges of a rigged election if the results that occur on election eve are changed, which they have been, for example, in a couple of congressional races in California last time, just because of the nature of the people who were voting uh, on, uh, by absentee compared to those who voted on election day or in the few days uh, beforehand. Now, beyond that, um, having a government that is filled with people who are not capable of doing their jobs, who are constrained in their ability to do their jobs, as we've seen, for example, with Deborah Burks and Anthony Fauci uh, and even Bob Redfield, um, who's not the right person to be heading the uh, CDC right now, but also what we've seen with people put into positions of influence who are corrupt or incapable of doing those jobs. Navigating through this crisis, including the economic element of it, is going to be very, very difficult. And it is pretty clear that we're going to end up with economic uh, repercussions for a very long period of time to come. One of the uh, inexplicable things right now to me is that 
McConnell and the Republicans are resisting providing the substantial amounts of aid to state governments, almost all of which are going very deeply into debt to cope with the pandemic and which have balanced budget amendments in their constitutions. And there's no easy way out of this without significant federal support. And whether that support will be forthcoming, what will happen when we have to cope with what's inevitable, which is many of those small businesses who struggled will uh, go out of business and not come back. Many of the jobs that existed before are not gonna be there when people uh, are able to go back to uh, acting the way they want. And I'm very skeptical that all of this will happen, even with the rosy projections of a vaccine. Uh, we know that there are a number of uh, vaccine uh, trials going forward, some of which are promising, but it's not just a matter of getting one that is safe for people, but having billions of uh, doses available and there to be administered um, in a short period of time. So, uh, and what we've seen in countries, of course, too, is that even where they've handled it very, very well and started to open up, they're getting more cases emerging. The uh, trick part of this right now is we've learned that the major form of transmission of COVID is through the air and that masks can have a dramatic impact on the number of cases and especially on the number of deaths. And when I see things like the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, refusing to let localities uh, demand that people wear masks in public, um, we know what the repercussions will be. And we're talking life and death almost literally here. Um, and all of that is going to play out in ways that we can't easily predict, except it's going to be a very rough road to hoe. And I would say finally, uh, before I stop to take questions, we often say that the election coming up is the most consequential in our lifetimes. This time it really is. And not just for the presidency, but also for the Senate and the House and for a host of other offices, including state legislatures, where we will have the redistricting take place uh, in the aftermath of the census and in positions like secretaries of state who run our elections looking towards the future. So that's the good news. Have a nice day. And I'm uh, very much open to questions. I think the way we were gonna handle that, if I'm not mistaken, is through uh, the hand raising function on Zoom. Yes. Can, can you hear me now? Yes. Can anyone hear me? You can, Norm? Yeah, we can hear you now. You're. Okay, I moved a little bit. Okay, I moved and my brother is in the closet. What can I say? Okay, um, does anyone have any questions? Well, people are deciding if they have a question. Um, I have one for you and that's it. I noticed that you spent some of your youth in Canada. Yes. Um, what do you think of, of what's going on there now? And if you had a choice, would you move there, Nar? Um, I would rather you would not move, move there. Um, I would rather not move. Um, I will say that if Trump wins re-election, okay, um, you're frozen okay. again, Susan. Um, I will say that if Trump <laughs> wins re-election, we will have a, a okay. Um, we will have a, uh, a different world to live in. And when I look at the moves that we've seen towards autocracy, when I look at uh, the Attorney General, at what will likely happen with the courts even further, um, uh, I don't know what decisions I would make, um, but we would be in a very different place. Um, I did spend a number of years in Canada. I went to high school there. My father was Canadian before he moved to Minnesota, and then we moved back uh, for uh, his jobs. Um, I love Canada, and uh, of course, they've handled uh, the uh, pandemic in a much better fashion than we have. They have a more civil society. They have 
a lot of the same issues that we have with divisions in their politics, with uh, racial divisions as well, um, although not to the same degree, in part because uh, they don't have quite the same history and they don't have the same uh, dynamics in population. Um, but uh, when you look at uh, Justin Trudeau, who has a lot of his own issues, including some ethical ones, compared to what we have, um, I have a lot of candid envy right now. Karen, can, Karen. One thing I would say to those of you raising your hands physically, um, at, if you go down to the bottom of your screen, there's a participant button. And if you click on the participant button, there'll be a place where you can raise your hand electronically, which is the way they can keep tabs um, uh, because my guess is Susan can't see everybody's faces either. And, um, All right, and because Susan's computer is a little, uh, the Wi-Fi is a little buggy, I'm going to take over the Q&A. Yes. So, um, yeah, we'd love to hear additional questions. And Karen, we'll go ahead and start with you. Okay, yeah, thank you. And I really appreciate your remarks. This is a great use of my power. Um, so my question for you is, I was thinking about what you said about how, you know, a lot of people don't answer their phones anymore when they see spam. And I am one of those people. I am completely guilty. So I'm just wondering what other indicators are there besides polls that we can look to to try to get a barometer of, of how people are feeling and how people are going to vote in this election? Or is there nothing? You know, there are cruder indicators, unfortunately, um, but uh, we don't have much beyond polls. You know, you can look at uh, things like who's showing up to different places. Um, what we've seen is sparser crowds for Trump in most places um, uh, than uh, we had before, uh, especially before COVID took over. What we've seen with the dramatic increase in crowds um, Foolishly, in many cases, people crowding together without masks uh, at some of these demonstrations because they feel so strongly. I'm a little worried about the implications of that. What we have to do is look at polls more skeptically and recognize, first of all, that there are a lot of bogus ones and that um, you have to look at a large number, put them all together, and you might have a better picture of where we are. It's not that they're completely off base. It's that you can't trust any individual result and anything that's within a point or two. If somebody's ahead by a point in a poll and uh, the analysts say that that uh, person is ahead, that's wrong because there's a wider range of error than we used to have before in part because of the response rates. Hey, thank you. All right, and then Mike, I know you had a couple questions that you had sent on through too. Would you like to ask those to Dr. Ornstein? Yes, thank you very much. First, Norm, let me thank you for your service in promoting civil society and rational discussion. We need more people like you in the uh, academic and private sector and government, of course. My question is this, we all know and love Minnesota. We all know and love Minneapolis. Yeah. How do you answer this question? Hmm. How can such a progressive city have overlooked racism and police department problems for many, many, many years? How, how do you explain that? Um, it's hard to explain, Mike. Um, and I think, uh, I'm, you know, a part of it is uh, out of sight, out of mind. And, you know, uh, we've continued to have uh, uh, segregation in the city, um, in a lot of the neighborhoods, uh, as we've had over many, many decades. You know, people living in the suburbs don't think of uh, what it's like in some of the neighborhoods where you have the concentrations of minorities. Another part of this, frankly, is, um, and it's true, I think, in many places around the country as well, that the way in which police departments have managed through handling cases of police violence and of uh, horrible racist behavior, um, something they've negotiated through their police unions, is that 
any of these instances gets handled through mandatory arbitration. And mandatory arbitration is um, a terrible way to do these things for this reason. You have uh, the agreement that the arbitrator has to be approved by both sides. And that means the police union representing the cop who's been accused of bad behavior and often the police chief who wants to fire the individual or take much harsher steps. And these arbitrators make their living by doing the arbitration. And they know that if they are tough on the cops, they're out of work. And so, you know, we've seen this one example in particular where the police chief, and of course we have a terrific progressive police chief in Minneapolis, had a cop with a history of horrible behavior, wanted to get rid of him, and the arbitrator did this ridiculous dance. The evidence was overwhelming that basically uh, uh, set the harshest penalty that we've seen in Minneapolis, which is 40 hours suspension unpaid. And when we get other instances where you get somebody shot um, and there's a wrongful death or a wrongful assault suit, and this is true around the country as well, the city pays. We pay, taxpayers pay, but it's hidden. You know, what you get is somewhere in the corner of the front section of the strip is going to be city settles on wrongful death suit, $12 million. But that's abstract to people, not concrete. And uh, what we also have, of course, is this, um, in some ways, given human nature, understandable silence by the other police. I will guarantee you that the vast majority of the police in Minneapolis know full well who the racists are and who the bad cops are. But if you as a police officer point that out, the history of this around the country is at best you get shunned. At worst, you get punished in a much more severe way. And that often what happens is the cop who gets fired is the one who files a report on the bad cop, not the bad cop. And what we're going to have to do is several things. One, we know that Minneapolis, you know, when I first saw this happening, I was shocked too, because we all want to think of Minneapolis as being this ideal place. Whenever I've had friends tell me their kids are moving to Minneapolis, I say, boy, you're, you're going to paradise, except for the winters. You've got wonderful people, wonderful culture, a business community that has the best corporate culture. You've got fantastic museums and the best university and all of those wonderful things. But we have turned a blind eye to the fact that the inequality in Minneapolis is sharper than it is in many other cities, that income disparities are greater, housing disparities are greater, and it's pretty obvious that um, we have all kinds of issues. And those are issues that have not been resolved, even though there have been major attempts made, going back to Don Fraser and through the other terrific mayors that we've had, that having leadership at the city level, having leadership with the police department doesn't do it. We're going to have to have, I think, a reckoning in the city, a greater sense of responsibility and sensitivity by whites in Minneapolis and in the state. But also, we do need to see these changes. Now, you know, defund the police is not adequate for me. Um, it's possible that you can uh, decommission the police department and, and reinstate uh, it in a different way. We saw that in Camden, New Jersey. It's far from perfect, but it can work. But I will tell you that what we need is to change the collective bargaining agreement. If there's collective bargaining with law enforcement, it ought to be over wages and benefits, you hear me? not over uh, the conduct of the police themselves. We need to have an independent panel that is not dependent on both sides agreeing, that is set up by, uh, you know, with the best citizens that we have, with arbitrators, if they're there, chosen at random and with no risk that if they do the right thing that they will be punished for it. We need to change the way in which wrongful death or wrongful assault suits are handled. I think that half the money, at least, ought to come out of the police pension fund. 
so that other police are going to know that they're going to pay a price if there's a bad cop. We need to uh, create a situation where if police know that there's bad behavior that, and they don't report it, that they suffer as well. You know, there are body cameras that are not turned on by the police officers that are kept on constantly. We need to have an appropriation that makes that happen so that you can have these situations as we saw in Louisville, Kentucky, for example, where uh, the cameras were uh, just coincidentally not on when they do violent acts. There are ways to handle this. And at the same time, Susan mentioned, I'm not sure every one of you heard, this documentary that we have uh, done through our foundation in memory of my late son. You can get it at pbs.org. It's called The Definition of Insanity. And in Miami-Dade County, a remarkable judge, by the way, with deep roots in Minneapolis, Steve Leifman, uh, has now trained 7,500 police officers in a 40-hour intensive program called uh, Crisis Intervention Team Policing which tr trains them how to de-escalate conflict. And partly as a consequence of this, because it's uh, been built around the encounters that police have had with people with mental illness, they're now getting 150 calls a month into their mental health hotline from police officers who have their own issues of PTSD and depression. And we have to recognize that more police die through suicide every year than they do through other things that happen on their jobs. So I want to weed out bad cops. I want to make sure they can't just move to another department. I want to have consequences for bad behavior, but I also want to make sure that our police are uh, in a position where they know how to de-escalate and where they can deal with their own issues because it's not an easy job and, I'm, uh, and we can't get rid of police. I'll just tell you one small thing. We were away, my wife and I, for... Uh, over a weekend, we went to the beach nearby here at Rehoboth. And at 2.30 in the morning, we got a call from the alarm company that our burglar alarm had gone off. Uh, and they automatically called the police. We're away. We don't know if somebody's broken into the house. It turned out these alarms sometimes have false uh, positives. And that is what apparently happened. I was ready to jump up and drive home. But of course, I was grateful that what happened is police came and spent 30 minutes searching all over in the neighborhood, in the alley, in the front yard, and making sure that nothing untoward had happened. We need police. There are bad things that happen, but we have to change what policing is. And that, I think Minnesota has to be at the leading edge of it. By the way, I would also hope that, um, that uh, the Minnesota Vikings would now sign Colin Kaepernick. I think it would be a great thing for the city, and I think it would be the right thing to do. Uh, and I hope, uh, if any of you know Mike uh, Zimmer, uh, put some pressure on him. David, do you have a question that you'd like to share uh, with Norm? Hi, yeah, thank you. And this is actually David's wife, Rebecca, also a Minnesota alum. Um, so thank you so much for the discussion. Um, I actually have two questions. One's narrow and one's broad. Um, first sort of one of my favorite topics of discussion. If you were advising Joe Biden, I'm curious who you would suggest he pick for a running mate. Um, and then more broadly, on the other side of the aisle, would love to get your thoughts on what you see as the trajectory of the Republican Party post-Trump, whether that's sure. in a few months or four years. So on the first, um, I will tell you that while I dearly want to see a woman as president of the United States, I kind of wish Joe had not made that promise because I actually think the best choice for running mate right now would be Cory Booker. Um, I want an African-American. I want somebody who has had experience as an executive, but also in Washington. I want somebody who shares with Biden that deep-seated empathy and compassion, and Cory does those things. And when I look at the universe of those he's considering, and there are some incredibly uh, smart, qualified people, that combination of everything doesn't come up for me. I will say that if I were choosing today, if he were making a choice today, and he's smart that he's not going to do it until August, 
my choice would probably be Val Demings. Here you have a woman who came from a uh, deeply underprivileged background, made her way, became a cop on the beat in a city that has its own racial tensions, rose up to become police chief, and then moved to Congress. And even though she hasn't been there for very long, if you watched her, including watching her in the impeachment process, this is one smart, capable, tough person. Uh, ready on day one to be president? Not exactly. And we don't know in the vetting whether all of her experience as a police officer will turn up some things that will be difficult. But uh, she would probably be my choice right now. I am becoming more and more enamored of Lance Bottoms, Keisha Lance Bottoms, the mayor of Atlanta, who's responded to this so well and so uh, uh, appropriately. Um, a mayor, you know, a good thing to have, um, but no national experience, no international experience, another toughie. The one who fits the bill on ready to be day one is, of course, Kamala Harris. And if I had to pick right now, it's who would be the most likely if we're putting out the odds, it would still be uh, Kamala Harris. Um, and I think she will be a fine candidate. Um, I will say that, you know, I, having been immersed in our national politics in Washington, knowing most of the senators, um, and knowing a lot of people in California, there are mixed views of her as a senator or back as an attorney general. But I think uh, I would view that with some enthusiasm as well. And of course, there are a number of others, uh, including others, uh, other people of color um, who uh, could do very well. Amy obviously would have been high on all of our lists. I think uh, it is extremely unlikely now, given what's happened in Minneapolis. I think that's uh, probably taken her off uh, the table uh, right now as uh, a running mate. If you are picking a running mate, one of the things you don't want to do is have a controversy right from the get-go. You don't want to have your campaign diverted by having a lot of discussion about issues with your vice president. Uh, and that's why the vetting process becomes uh, so critical. Now, on the Republican Party, um, I'm not sanguine. First of all, I've written a number of things that uh, very bluntly say it's no longer a party, it's more a cult. And when I've tried to look at why people like Bob Corker, now retired, uh, Jeff Flake, now retired, who did step outside a little bit and got shunned for it, but who also voted for the tax bill that was a deeply irresponsible act. Uh, Susan Collins, Lamar Alexander, uh, and all the others, those who are not gonna be lobbyists and don't need the clients, uh, who are not running in a primary where they're worried that they'll be bumped off because they've been disloyal, but they've still done everything and marched in lockstep. It's because in a cult, the fear of being shunned or excommunicated is an overwhelming one. And that's what's happened. Now, beyond that, I, I do not believe that the issues that have created this dysfunction um, are uh, because of Trump. Trump is more um, uh, a response to dysfunction than uh, he is the creator of it. He's been an accelerant. It'll be there after he's gone. And if you look at some of the things that have happened or things that people have said in the last uh, few weeks, you have blatantly racist statements made by uh, members of city councils, county chairmen in Texas and in other places for the Republican Party. You have uh, an instance in Virginia where a freshman congressman named Denver Riggleman, who has been down the line with Trump on everything, but presided over a same-sex marriage, he's a libertarian, and was just denied renomination by the Republican Party for that. What that tells me is the farm team is gonna move even more in a Trumpian direction than what we've seen now with Trump going. And that is not a good thing for the country. A democracy like ours needs two functioning, problem-solving parties. And the Republican Party is gonna be a conservative party. It's now a radical party. It is not a problem-solving party. We're not grappling through the Republican Party now with climate change, with the international economy, 
with our alliances and our role in the world, with what will happen to the dollar, with <clears throat> the pandemic, with responding to be prepared for future pandemics. Uh, we're not responding to the problems of poverty in the country. The responses on racial division are minimal just to get through a crisis. And that's not a good thing for us. And I believe it'll take not just a huge defeat in 2020, but another defeat in 2022, three elections in a row, to jolt it back to giving some traction to those conservatives who want to return to problem solving. That doesn't mean we'll have an absence of bickering, um, but we can at least have a debate where we start with the premise of problems that are real and then work towards what the solutions ought to be. But we're going to be in the wilderness with this, I think, for some time to come. And of course, it is amplified and accelerated by tribal media. Um, I will tell you, when I look at Britain with the consequences that flow from Brexit, when I look at Australia, where even though they've responded well on the pandemic, they've turned a blind eye to climate change, which is devastating to the country. Wildfires and uh, temperatures that are unhealthy into the 110s and more in different parts of the country. And I look at ours, what do they have in common? Rupert Murdoch and Fox. And Murdoch, who dominates the media in Australia, has pushed for climate denial. Murdoch's media in Britain were as responsible for Brexit as anybody. Murdoch here is as responsible as anybody for racial division and for through people like Lou Dobbs, uh, Tucker Carlson, and Sean Hannity, and for uh, the response that we're getting, including the refusal to wear masks so you can own the libs. Uh, that's uh, having an impact on the pandemic. And that's not going away either because the business model works. And by the way, helped along the way by people like uh, Jeff Zuckerberg, uh, who's only interested in making the last dime uh, on Facebook and doesn't care if there's manipulation by Russian bots or by others spreading uh, disinformation and what is really fake news. So there. All right, so we probably have time for one more question. Does anyone have a question that they'd like to ask at this time? This is Sue Parsons. Go ahead, uh, my, Sue. Question, my question is uh, um, back on the um, November voting. Uh, what can we do? Is there some organization or something that we can get involved in that uh, is working towards a better, uh, more um, fair election or election processes or, or anything like that? Uh, yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, there are a number of organizations that are uh, active in the courts and elsewhere to try and make sure that uh, the vote is fair. Uh, one of the things that I do uh, is I'm chair of a group called the Campaign Legal Center, um, which has brought um, a whole series of lawsuits, including the successful one in Florida, that took away what was effectively a poll tax for uh, the uh, felons who'd served their sentences and where in an overwhelming referendum, Florida voters had said, give them back their voting rights. And we filed lawsuits on absentee votes and on uh, some of the other issues in a number of other states, including Texas and Georgia. So the Campaign Legal Center is uh, one. The uh, uh, Leadership Conference on Civil Rights uh, is another. The Legal Defense Fund of the NAACP is a third. Uh, I would also say there are nonpartisan voting groups, and of course there's one that uh, is being spearheaded by um, uh, the uh, former First uh, Lady Michelle Obama that is active in trying to make sure people are registered and getting them out to vote. So that would help What's important in Minnesota is making sure that we don't have any of the issues occurring in the fall that we've seen in so many other states. And that means making sure that absentee uh, ballot applications go to everybody, making sure that there are adequate poll workers, maybe even volunteering to be a poll worker if that will work, 
for you. Uh, one of the proposals that I've made is that a uh, state print up uh, massive numbers of absentee ballots that include the envelope, which requires a signature verification, um, and have them available at polling places so that if people don't get their ballots on time, because you can do everything right, put in your application, and the Postal Service may not be able to get you your ballot, um, that you can fill it out on the spot and have a repository to put it there. And if there are places where there are long lines and with social distancing, the potential for waiting in line for hours, uh, having the option to fill out an absentee ballot there as well, you know, with a, uh, an affidavit, of course, that you're eligible to do so, um, so that at least you have the opportunity to vote and not just disappear because you can't wait in line because you have work or other things uh, for hours at, uh, at a time. So there are things we can do within the state and things to push for, uh, but you can also contribute in different ways to organizations that are going to be working overtime to making sure that we can uh, have the election we deserve. I can do one. Uh, I'm, is there another question? If not, thank you all for joining and uh, go Gophers. Can you hear me, Norm? Yes, Susan. Okay, I'm, I'm going to try. First of all, I want to thank you. Um, you are a treasure for Minnesota and our country and the world, and we are very blessed to have you with us today. And I want to thank Kablia, um, the magician back in Minneapolis who took care of all of this and filled in. I apologize for um, my computer. And I want to say that Norm is the first, but in July, we are going to have our 2015 Above Average Alumni Award winner, Tom Jelton, as our guest. He is the Religion and Belief Correspondent for um, NPR. And I think his take on everything will be um, very interesting. So that's coming in July. And if any of you can think of things that we might be able to do to enhance your time um, in isolation, please uh, email us at umaadc at gmail.com. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Arnstein. We love you and have a good day, everyone.